Hello, everybody. Hi. Excuse my voice. It's a little funny today, but good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, wherever you're watching, and uh, welcome to another installment, to another little, little video as promised. And as I promised in the previous one, we're going to start learning the Bible. We're going to start learning about God. And we're going to do this in a very, very simple way. very practical way. So before I can even introduce the Bible, we all have to know what the Bible is and be on the same page. So I'd like you, if it's all right with you, uh, to subscribe to my channel and to give this video a like to help me get things started with the algorithm and all that other stuff. It's a pleasure for me to do this. It's been many years coming because My worry is always my personal business, making a living and all these other things that I've neglected this part, this aspect of my life, because I am a student of, of uh, religion. I study religion at Nations University in Louisiana, uh, although be it uh, distant learning, and I also study human medicine. I mentioned this in my videos. Um, obviously, in this channel, For now, I'm going to be making videos about the Bible and the world of the Bible and the universe and God, but we're going to get into other things as well, like lifestyle, motivation, food, travel. All those things are going to come at the right time. For now, let's focus on the universe, so to speak. All right, so before you even touch the Bible, you need to know what the Bible is, and let me start pulling out. my whiteboard, and we can start drawing a few things or illustrating a few things. I think it's really cool that you can use a whiteboard. And I'm so glad that Google led in this whole thing because technology five years ago was begging for the ability to write. Uh, I'm not sponsored by X Pen, but I use a digital... notepad and an X pen. Uh, I use this in my profession to teach English, but also to teach other subjects, uh, especially religion. So it helps me out a lot. So I'm not using my mouse. I'm using an X pen uh, and an X pen tablet, which is a real luxury, best money I've ever spent. All right. So if you, if, if we talk about the Bible and you do not come from the Jewish world, You are like a normal person. You are immediately introduced into the world of the Christian Bible. So there's two, there's two different Bibles that exist. It's the Tanakh, which is the original Bible, a Jewish Bible. And on the other side, we have a Christian Bible, which is called the Holy Bible. So the Holy Bible is Christian. Holy Bible is Christian, the Tanakh is Jewish. Actually, it's not even Jewish, it's Hebrew. Some aspects of it are Jewish, depending on the history of the book. And basically, it is Hebrew. That's what it is. Biblically correct way to referring to it is that it is Hebrew. And that's the truth. Um, the reason why I say... but it is more Hebrew than Jewish is because not everything that's in the Bible comes from the Jewish tradition because the people of Israel, there are two groups, the people of Israel. These are Sumerians or the Northern Kingdom, which are in the North, and then Jews who are from the tribe of Judah. Judah and Benjamin are one tribe. They're called the Jews. And then the rest of the 10 tribes of Israel, which divided, which were divided from Israel, those are called Samaritans or Samarians or the Northern Kingdom. So the foundations of the Holy Bible is the Tanakh. But I'm going to tell you basically what's going on here. So this is the this is the real thing. This is the original. So what happens here is God. 
God works. What does it mean God works? It means God does work. What does God do? God creates the world using words. So even before there was a book, there was a word or words. And these words we can re re refer to as oral tradition. So for us to take oral tradition and codify it into something that people can learn from, it results in a book, all right? So God works, he does all sorts of cool things. Then Moshe Rabbeinu in, in the Jewish world is, is Moses uh, in English, okay? So Moshe or Moses writes what God did. So God do, uh, does stuff and everybody knows what God does because of oral tradition. Then oral tradition is codified and written so that people and generations can learn about what happened in the past. So what does this tell us? It tells us that first, uh, first are the words, oral. Then for the purpose of teaching of posterity and for the preservation of words, in second place, we have a written tradition or we can just call it written works which give us the bible okay so in the case of the jewish world which is where the bible comes from the bible doesn't come from the christian world the christian world has appropriated the bible and used it to advance the roman empire using the bible and its teachings now number three what happens next so God does work. Moses writes five books that are dedicated to God's works. All right? So we call these books the Torah, which means teaching in Hebrew. So the word Torah means teaching or the teaching. All right? So Torah means teaching. So the Bible starts with five books. So there's five books that are written by Mo, Moshe Rabbeinu or Moses. After that, books are written about people who take part in God's story. All right, so the Tanakh or the Holy Bible is God's story. This is what God is doing, God's story. We can say God's action or God's interaction with humanity. God's action and interaction with humanity. One of the words that I really hate in the English language is this, is this word. There's no word in English that I hate more than God forsaken. Because God forsaken is a lie. Because God interacts or has always interacted with human beings. But even before God interacted with human beings, God has always interacted with this planet. So to talk about a place being God forsaken in the English language, people say, oh, this God forsaken country, this God forsaken world. It's not true. It's an absolute lie. God never left. <laughs> and that's one phrase. That's one adjective in English that I absolutely hate because it's not true. So we have five books in the Bible, all right, because Moses wrote everything that God did in his interaction with human beings. These five books, of course, are Genesis, uh, Exodus, uh, Numbers, Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, with Leviticus, not in not in not in this order. Leviticus and the last one is Deuteronomy. These are the five books: one, two, three, four, and five. Not in that order, though. Probably Leviticus goes 
after after Exodus somewhere. Anyways, you can double check that if you want to. If it's important to you to fact check the order, please do. But I'm just doing this for the sake of the teaching. If I was writing an exam, yes, I'd have to know. <laughs> but anyways, here we are. Um, so five books are written by Moses. And then after that, books are written about other people. All right. So these five books of Moses are called the Torah. The, 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 sorry, the first five books are called the Torah. So the Torah is, can I change colors here? Yes, I can change cups. So Torah is abbreviated to this, ta. That's the first five books, is ta. The next part of the book is the prophets. The next part of the Bible are the prophets, which in Hebrew are called nevi'im. Nevi'im, which means the prophets. So, Let's use blue. Um, this part, na, is for the Nevi'im, the prophets. Right? As is ta for Torah. The next one is ketuvim. Ketuvim uh, is this part. The k at the end. Ketuvim are wisdom writings. So the Torah, oh, I don't want to highlight it. So the Torah is the teaching. These are the first five books of the Bible, they're called the teaching. What does this mean? It means that you can never, ever, in your whole life, understand the books of the Bible that follow these five books if you don't study the Torah. If you don't study the Torah, please do not expect to understand what the prophets are talking about. Do not expect to know what the wisdom writings are talking about because all of it is based on the Torah, okay? And I will show you as we learn together in the next few months, how the whole world, the whole world and the universe and its existence pivot upon the Torah. They are built upon the Torah. But anyways, we have, we're not in the Bible yet. I'm still giving you an introduction, so I'll hold my horses. So the Torah is the teaching, the Nevi'im, are the prophets. Now, there are no prophets anywhere that talk about Israel and God except in the Tanakh. If a prophet, if somebody says they are a prophet of God and they are not from the tribe of Levi, which is part of the tribe of Israel, in modern language, if they are not a Jew, they cannot be a prophet. But even if, even among Jews today, they cannot be prophets because the prophets already been. They are all determined in this Nevi'im. Apart from this Nevi'im, there are no more prophets. We have here, uh, I'm going to show you the divisions, actually. I'm gonna, when I finish all of this, I'm going to share on my screen the, the different divisions of the, uh, of the, of the prophets. Uh, in Christianity, they have what's called minor prophets in Christian theology, where people are taught about um, minor prophets. Why, 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 why? Uh, so people are taught about minor prophets in Christianity, and then people are also taught about major prophets already this is wrong and not because we're beating up christianity it's because if you try to guess what something means you always get it wrong and that's why christianity gets things wrong all the time because it doesn't want to learn from the hebrew people or from the jews it wants to use its own uh, uh, western methods of exegesis to understand an eastern document an eastern treatise 
that's mission impossible. It, it's just not possible. For example, if I came from, which I do come from the Afro-Asiatic world, if I didn't learn Western classics, I wouldn't understand Western thinking and Western uh, Western uh, literature. Uh, the same with Westerners, if they don't learn uh, the classics of the East, uh, whether in the form of the Quran, whether in the form of the Torah, or the form of any scripts from Timbuktu or from Arabia, you will never understand Eastern thought. You just never will. You will always arrive at the wrong uh, exegetical conclusion. And then the next one, we have the Ketuvim. That this is the Jewish division. We have the Ketuvim, which are the wisdom writings, right? Wisdom writings like the Psalms, um, the Psalms, Song of Solomon, uh, Lamentations, etc., etc., Proverbs. These are wisdom writings, Ketuvim. So the Jewish Bible is now complete. We have uh, the Tanakh, and which is in Hebrew, which is the Torah, the prophets, and, and the wisdom writings. The Jewish Bible is complete. Where it says minor prophets, major prophets in, in Christianity. In Judaism, you have major prophets. Uh, you have major prophets. I stand to be corrected. I'll look at, I'll look at it just now. But from an academic point of view, we can say we have major prophets and latter prophets. What does it mean, latter prophets? It means the prophets, the prophets who prophesied towards the end of the prophetic era. These are people like Mal Malach Malachi, okay? Melachi. Uh, Melachi or Malachi is the last prophet, and therefore the Jewish Bible ends with the last book being Malachi. All right. So beyond Malachi, there's no uh, there's there's no Jewish biblical works. And in biblical writing, there's a gap of 400 years in the history of the Hebrews and the Israelites, which includes the Jews and the rest of the Israelites. There's 400 years of no production of biblical works. And then the 400 years, which I'll call it the 400-year lap, after the 400 years, then comes a hint of biblical work, which is the New Testament. Now, the Jewish people do not accept the, the New Testament. They reject it uh, fero vehemently, ferociously, uh, because it implies talking about a very famous rabbi in the rest of the world, but not accepted in Judaism, and that is Yeshua ben Yosef ben Abraham whom the Gentiles call Jesus. All right, so then comes the New Testament. After this 400-year lap, uh, what happens after the 400-year lap is in 100, sorry, not 100. So this man whom the Jews don't want to acknowledge is called Jesus by the Christians and the Romans, but... In the Jewish world, his, name, his proper name is Yeshua ben Yosef ben Abraham. He lived any time between uh, minus 4 BCE. This is more or less when he lived. And he died in uh, 33... Uh, um, I'm tempted to write AD, but of course, academia has changed this to the common era CE. If you're Catholic, AD, Anno Domini, right? So four years before 1 BC, this guy is born and he lives between minus 4 and 33 before the common era and uh, 33 years after the common era. So let's say that his work covers the first 40 years, the first four decades of the first century. Uh, of the first century. 
during the common era CE. I love this century. And I get the feeling that one day when I do my PhD, I might decide to become a specialist in the history, in Jewish history of the first uh, of the first century of the common era, because that was a, a world changing uh, period. So let's say the first 40 years, there's big talk about this, this rabbi from Nazareth. And then his disciples live and they systematically get murdered by the Romans all the way up to 64 of the common era. Why were they murdered? Is it because they followed this man named Yeshua? No. It's because all the Jews, all the Jews, whether they were following this rabbi named Yeshua uh, or not, all the rabbis were being persecuted by the Romans and the Greek, not, well, we have to call them Greco-Roman because it's a combination. It was more of a, co more of a coalition uh, type government because the Romans conquered the Greeks, but they didn't dispel Greek teachings in Greek culture and script and language. So these Romans and Jews were communicating in Greek in the Holy Land. And so all these rabbis were being nailed to the cross outside the city of Jerusalem. So this Jesus guy or Yeshua Hanotsri, he's not special in this manner because all the Jewish rabbis who, who were teaching the Torah, who were teaching this wonderful book, were being crucified and murdered by the Romans, the Greco-Romans. Now, by 64, most of them are killed. The one who remains, his name is Yohanan. He's carried off to the, to the island of Patmos in Greece. This is where the Romans keep him prisoner because they couldn't kill him because he was a tzaddik, all right? He was a tzaddik. So what is a tzaddik? Someone who learns the Torah, perfects it and lives it, they get what's called spirit of nevuah. Nevuah can be loosely translated in English as the spirit of prophecy, which is the same as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uh, and the spirit of prophecy are the same thing. Because what happens is, Somebody who receives the spirit of nevuah because they study and master the Torah and they become holy, they become a tzaddik, a holy person, loosely translated into English as a saint, then these people sort of have a supernatural ability about them. And this guy, this rabbi named Yohanan, uh, he was exiled on Patmos. The Romans tried to kill him. They tried to fry him in oil. They tried to put him in a drum with nails. They tried every sort of Roman torture on him, but he wouldn't die. So they just exiled him on the island of Patmos, hoping that he will die. So this guy would write the book in, in, in Hebrew called Hit, Hit Galut, which means the apocalypse. Hit Galut, which means what happens at the end of the world. He writes this book on the island of Patmos in the year 90 of the Common Era, 90 CE of the Common Era. In the year 70 of the Common Era, Titus is sent to, to put down the Zealots. The Zealots were a Jewish sect. So in Judaism, you never had Jews who had the same... Uh, point of view regarding the scriptures or regarding the interpretation of the scriptures, the Jewish people have always differed on what the scriptures actually mean. But even though they differed, there's a constant tradition that is both oral and written, right? Which guides the Jewish people even in their differences. So the Zealots were one of the sect. This guy named Yeshua that we talked about whom the Jews reject to this day, Yeshua was a Pharisee. A Pharisee is a rabbi today in, in today's language. 
And then, of course, if you read the Christian Bible, you also hear about the Sadducees. Is it double D? I'm not too sure. Maybe. Maybe it's like this. The Sadducees were the priests, the corrupt priests who wanted to rule everybody. So the priests, the Sadducees, were fighting a genocide against the rabbis. Not fighting, they were instigating a genocide. The priests want to annihilate the rabbis so that they can have absolute power over the land of Israel and over the Jewish people. So anyways, in 70 CE, back to the story, this Roman named Titus, ruthless Roman, he, he was the cousin of the emperor, he comes to the land of Israel and he destroys the temple in Jerusalem. All right, so... The Jews today have a wailing wall because they are wailing the, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So in 70 AD, Titus destroys the temple, sets it alight. He fulfills the prophecy of Rabbi Yeshua, who said that no stone will remain upon another. So in the Christian Bible, in the New Testament, there is a prophecy like this, and it, it is fulfilled by Titus, who comes and flattens Jerusalem and sadly the temple. And the Jews have been without a, a temple and proper Judaism ever since, because proper Judaism requires the sacrifice of animals. Without the sacrifice of animals, Judaism had to go through a transition from animal sacrifice from the temple to what's called a prayer book, which is a Sidur. So Judaism was temple-centered, but after Titus destroyed the temple, it became book-centered. So you have the Sidur, you have the Talmud, which teaches Judaism after the temple has been destroyed. Okay? Then we'll talk about the Talmud some some years from now, I think. I think the Bible is going to keep us busy for a few years before we can talk about the Talmud. So when this Rabbi Yeshua dies, around about 33 AD, the Jews are taken into captive in 70 AD when Titus flattens the temple. The, Jew, the Jews become slaves in Rome. The Jews then become slaves in Rome. And they're all shipped to Rome, and some, a few, remain in the Holy Land. But mostly they get shipped off to Rome. Others are exiled in Europe, others in the East, etc., etc., all over the world, Jews who are in exile. But this lot is important, the ones that are taken to Rome, because the Jews that are taken to Rome are the ones who write the New Testament because among them were Jews who believed that Yeshua ben Yosef ben Abraham was the Messiah son of Yosef. So the New Testament is written by Jews in Rome. So the Romans get a hold of the Jewish books. Uh, the Romans, now that the Jews are in captivity, uh, the Romans go, oh, what's that? It's a Tanakh, mine, so they take it. So the Romans appropriate the Tanakh. I'm going to use the word steal because that's what it was. The Romans steal the Tanakh. The Romans steal the New Testament. And then the Romans will take 800 years to rewrite to rewrite the Tanakh and the New Testament in order to prove Christology. Christology is a Christian study of whether Jesus is God or not. So the Romans wanted to prove Christology because they understood Jesus to be a God which is not the case because in Judaism he was not, he was a tzaddik. 
And then number two, the Romans wanted to prove that every prophecy is about, is about Jesus in the Bible. So they changed the Tanakh, the Romans, and they changed the New Testament, both uh, literature, and they merge it together. So you have the Tanakh plus the New Testament. This gives us the Christian Bible. Oops. So the Christian Bible is Jewish Bible plus the Nazarene history, which is, let's call this the Christian Bible. I'm going to explain to you what uh, the Nazarene history is. All right. So I'd like you to take all of this, actually to just have a look. Maybe pause the video and have a look at all these things that I've written and consider all of these points, okay? Right. Assuming that you've done that, you've paused the, the video and you have considered all these points, let me make some space. All right. Let me just make some space here. Because now I need to explain to you exactly what the New Testament is. But before I talk about the New Testament, well, actually, let me start with that because I'm going to forget. Something happens after age 40 that makes people to forget things that were on their lips or in their minds. Uh, it's called aging, and I absolutely dread it. Don't feel old yet, but it just happens sometimes that something is on the tip of your tongue, and then it's gone. <laughs> um I wish my eraser was a lot faster. Anyways, here we are. Maybe I should phone, uh, I should email XPen and ask them to have a, a quick eraser feature. I know the eraser is on the pen, but I just need a quicker one. Anyways, so let's cordon that off, right? Now, the Tanakh, the Nevi'im and Ketuvim, so the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, tells us about God and what and his and uh, his interaction with humans. But the Greco-Romans, the Greco-Romans. The Greco-Romans, they don't like God at all. Greco-Romans don't like God at all because God is one. So the real reason why in the first century, the Romans are nailing the rabbis to the cross is because the rabbis are teaching the Tanakh or the Jewish Bible to Jewish people. And the Romans, the Greco-Romans would rather have these Jewish people westernized and Hellenized and Western standards and beliefs and religion imposed upon them. What's the problem? Is because the Tanakh says that God is one. Adonai Echad, God is one. They like the Greco Romans, the idea that this Jesus fellow, whom the Jews were following, some, some of them, was becoming a problem to the Romans. Because under Roman rule, you were supposed to have many gods, okay? So the Romans, the Greco-Romans, wanted many gods. A person cannot believe in one god, but must have many gods. This is what the Romans wanted. But Judaism doesn't want that. It says one god, Adonai Echad. So the rabbis were persecuted to death, murdered, absolutely murdered and tortured because of the oneness of God. So the Greco-Romans didn't like God and the pioneers of Christianity, which come from Greco-Romans, as people like Marcion, who is a Greco-Roman who believed that Yeshua was supernatural 
and therefore became a church father. This is where church fathers come from. They're the Greco-Roman founders of Christianity. The Jewish people did not found Christianity. The Nazarene Jews that followed Yeshua or Jesus did not found Christianity. It was founded by Marcion, a Greco-Roman. And because the Greco-Romans hated God and his judgment and the Ten Commandments, uh, Marcion says, hey, uh, let's call this the Old Testament. So the Romans called it the Old Testament. So it's old. Nobody should read it. It's got nothing to do with your salvation. That's what they say. And that's how. That's why in the church there's no emphasis on reading or studying properly the Old Testament because they say you've got Jesus, you've got salvation, you've got heaven. What more do you need? Don't study that old book. And the reason why they don't want you to study or they don't want to teach it to you because you'll discover that God is one. Adonai Echad, there's no trinity because Greco-Romans took the spirit of Nevua and personified it and made it a third person, a trinity, in order to satisfy this Roman need and law to have many gods. All right? So the Jews... In captivity, the Tanakh has been stolen from them. It's being rewritten. Now the New Testament is being written in Rome because the Jews did not have an opportunity to write down what happened in Judea because the series of events in succession were a lot. So they didn't have time to sit and reflect and write. They only do this in Rome. So this... Uh, this New Testament is not called the New Testament. It's Jewish writings, properly known as the Besora Hageula. Besora Hageula in English is the good news. Hey, 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 what's wrong with my spelling? In English, this is called the good the good news of salvation. Every little bit of the Old Testament is written by Jews, except for Luke. Luke was a Western historian. Actually, he was a doctor, not a formal historian. He was a he was a part time historian, or maybe we should call him a biographer. He was a doctor by trade, but a Westerner who saw the life and the story of the disciples and this man named Jesus or Yeshua properly in 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 uh, in in, uh, in Hebrew. Actually, uh, Yeshua is not Hebrew. Yeshua is Aramaic. Uh, and Jesus or Yeshua spoke Aramaic. And the Jews of the time also spoke Ar Aramaic. Hebrew was only for liturgy and for studying Torah. It was not an everyday language. It was called Lashon Kodesh, which means the holy language of the scriptures. People, common people spoke Aramaic. So Yeshua is actually Aramaic. Properly in, in Hebrew, it's Yehoshua or Joshua in English. So anyways, here's a Besorat HaGeula being written by the Jews. The Romans say, thank you, we'll keep that too. So the Besorat HaGeula, just like the, the, the Bible, it is stolen, appropriated, stolen by the Romans. Stolen and rewritten. A rewritten is actually a strong word. I would say it was changed. Because not all of it was rewritten. It was just changed. Key words and key phrases and key teachings. They added stuff and removed stuff. I'm going to show you, as I teach you the Bible, I'm going to show you how it was removed and put, and, and new thing, new ideas were put in. If you go to academia and you ask for the proof of the changing of the Bible, you will never find it. You need to know the Old Testament in order to see how the Old Testament itself was changed. When you studied in Hebrew, you will see very clearly in, in Greek or English that some things were changed deliberately. And also when you study the New Testament, 
uh, you can only come, come to its understanding if you know the, the Old Testament. Okay. So churches out there that only study the New Testament, those people are lost, completely lost. They still don't know God because they say God is Jesus or Yeshua, which is not true. And that's not the intention of the New Testament either. So this Besorat HaGeula was stolen and changed. Now it's called the New Testament, right? New because of this guy Marcion again and his, and his church founding gang called the Church Fathers. So they call it the New Testament, and that's relevant for the church. But the question is, is the New Testament the Bible? That is a big question. That is an important question. That question I'm going to answer right now, but I need to make some space. I wish my eraser was like twice the size. In uh, Microsoft Word, the eraser is massive. You can clear so much stuff in such a short time. This eraser is tiny. Hey, Zoom, can we have a bigger eraser, please? <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to have to do this in Spanish as well. This is going to be quite a busy year. So that our Spanish friends, which is the second most spoken, actually, yeah, the second most spoken language in the world, one being Chinese Mandarin. So we have to do these videos in Spanish as well. Maybe I'll put some Portuguese subtitles to them to save myself the energy and the time, but we'll see what happens. Con el correr del tiempo, with the passing of time. Alrighty. Sheesh, I'm still erasing. Could have a, could have had a cup of tea while I'm erasing this. Ooh, all right. So what about the New Testament? What on earth is the New Testament? All right, let's talk about the Bible first. So Bible, this word Bible is not in the Bible. <laughs> Bible is not in the Bible. It comes from the Greek. And the Greek word is biblios. Biblios means a collection of books. A collection of books. Books are not in the Jewish world. Okay, In the Jewish world, we have sefer. Sefer, Hebrew. It means a scroll. There are no books in the East. We have scrolls. Right? Books are a modern invention. Scrolls. So sefer scrolls. The Greeks said, ah, biblios. Okay. So that changed the whole thing. And, it, and the Jews also, because they were colonized people, they spoke Greek. So they also use the word biblios and therefore Bible. In, in Judaism, or in the land of Israel... You had the temple. The temple was in Jerusalem. And we miss this temple like you won't believe. I'm not a Jew. I'm an Israelite. But in modern religious language, people could call me a Jew. But I'm an Israelite, descendant of a biblical Israelite, a Danites. Danim. Yeah. So in the temple were two things. There was the temple number one. And then there was an institution, all right? We'll call this institution the Sanhedrin. Again, using Greek. Sanhedrin in Greek. In Hebrew, this is properly called the Beit Din. Beit Din means the court or the courthouse. The Beit Din was made up of 70 elders. 70 elders chosen from all the different sects of Judaism and all from all different tribes to represent the, the people of God in the temple. And then the Beit Din was also regional. Like in your province, you also had a Beit Din of 23 elders. 
that took decisions. So you didn't always have to go to Jerusalem. If you wanted a Beit Din ruling, you could go to your regional court of 23 elders, which could be in your province or your city or your hometown. Uh, in Acts, in, in the Christian Bible, if you go to Acts 15, uh, there's a debate about whether non-Jews should be circumcised or not. And the court decides that no, they should just keep the seven uh, laws of Noah if they want to live among the Jews. And the question was very important and poised to Jewish people by the followers of Yeshua. They went to the Jewish court. So there's those people who believe that Yeshua never existed, even in Judaism, those people have been fed a lie because it did exist. They went to the court and they asked, what about these Greeks that are following this, this Nazarite? Uh, should they be circumcised and become 100% Jews or not? The court of elders, Jewish Jews, they decided that no, they should keep the seven Noahide laws. And this happens in Acts chapter 15. The details that I've given you are not in that verse. You have to understand the Jewish world before you can understand what's written in the New Testament. So the Beit Din of 70 elders, they decided on the books. They decided which books should become part of the Jewish Biblios or Bible. In Christianity, this is called canon. So it was the 70 elders uh, who were together with a man named Ezra, who also has a book in the Bible, an elder called Mordechai, a prophet called Nehemiah, and the 70 elders. These people, one, two, three, and four. They came back from Babylon and they codified, they codified the prayers and the Jewish books. So legally, legally speaking, the New Testament is not the Bible. Okay, let me spell this out to you. There are Messianic rabbis who say the New Testament is, is the Bible. I know a little bit of Jewish law and Jewish law has weight. It has weight. It, it, it means something. So New Testament is not equal to Bible. However, the New Testament is biblical material. Why is it called biblical material? Because biblical is an adjective so everything that's talked about in the New Testament, it has a relationship with the Tanakh. Again, the Jews will say, oh, there's no relationship with the Tanakh, but there is. Because a lot of things that this Jesus guy or this Yeshua properly, Yeshua ben, ben Yosef ben Abraham, he teaches highlights of the Torah, which is the Ta in Tanakh. And of course, in the New Testament, there's also a part representing the Nevi'im, which are the prophets over here. And of course, the New Testament also touches on the Ketuvim, which are the wisdom writings. All the rabbis that teach in the writings of the New Testament or recorded as having taught in the New Testament, all of them touched on the Tanakh. So the New Testament is biblical material, but it is not the Bible because it was not approved by the Jewish court together with the 70 elders or the Beit Din because Titus destroyed the temple. And therefore, when the temple was destroyed, so was the institution of the Beit Din. It did not exist anymore. The Beit Din could not make rulings in the absence of the temple. Those things go hand in hand in Judaism, the temple and the Beit Din. So the Bible existed first before the New Testament. It was the Christians, the Romans, that made the New Testament Biblios or the Bible. Okay? I hope that helps. If, it, if you're a bit confused, just rewind and listen to me again. So, 
how does the New Testament become the Bible? Good question. So the, the Jews are now in captivity in Rome. So the Romans have stolen the Tanakh. The Romans have also stolen the New Testament. So the Romans do their maths and they say Tanakh plus good news, Besora equals Bible to them. The church has zero, zero authority to make a Bible because it is not a Jewish institution, even though it has appropriated and used Jewish material, the church has no authority to pronounce what is a Bible and not or not, because the church does not have the temple of God. The church does not have the 70 elders or the Beit Deen. Does it mean that Christians are excluded from the writings of the Bible? No, they're not excluded. On the contrary, the Jews and the Israelites exist for the benefit of the nations. The, the Israelite people were meant to be a biblical light to the world. So the Tanakh on its own is a light into the world, a very big light. The New Testament is, is, is a group of people who are living out what's written in the Tanakh. So the New Testament is also a light to the world because inside of it are Jews who are living out the Tanakh. You understand? So some Messianic rabbis say the New Testament is the Bible, but I would not say that because I have a deep respect for Jewish law and things that are established by the 70 elders and the temple. So for me as a Bible teacher, the New Testament, New Testament equals Jewish history and biographies. The New Testament is Jewish history and biographies. In the New Testament is also prophecy and revelation. Hence the book of Hilga Hitkalut, because there's revelation. In the New Testament are rabbinic letters, rabbinic letters that are called Igeret. All right. Let's make some space. So an Igeret, an Igeret is a rabbinic letter. Rabbinic, what, why am I writing funny today? So an Igeret is a rabbinic letter. What is a rabbinic letter? When there's a group of Jews living, let's say, in Tanzania, in Africa, and it's a small group of Jews in Tanzania, they want to know what the program is for Passover, for Pesach. What's the halacha? What's the program for, for, for Passover? Then the Jews in Johannesburg, in Glen Hazel, some rabbi writes a letter to the Tanzanian Jews and say, Tanzanian Jews, I hope you are well. Shalom Aleichem. I, I do hope you are doing well. Uh, this is what you must do for Pesach. That's a rabbinic letter. It's an Igeret. And the Greco-Romans call this an epistle. I wouldn't call it an epistle because an epistle just means a messenger, right? Or a message sent by a messenger. But this is different from Eastern thought because a rabbinic letter conveys teaching an alacha, teaching on, on the Torah and teaching on how you should do certain, observe certain uh, uh, festivals and rituals of Judaism and you get it. So in the New Testament, you have a collection of things you have Jewish history. It is mostly Jewish history in the New Testament. Jews might not pick this up because they don't go into the New Testament with uh, 
academic ideas in mind. They go in there to refute it. So they miss out on a lot of riches of Jewish history. But if you go into the New Testament without any problems with people or anyone, you will find a lot of treasures. It is prophecy. It is revelation. And it is rabbinic letters. You get it. So how many things, what, what kind of things do we find? Jewish history, biographies of Jewish rabbis and communities. There's prophecy. There's revelation. And there's rabbinic letters, which is number five. The theme of revelation begins in Matthew 24. So I want you to understand this one, that the book of Revelation or the idea of Revelation, it's actually not a book, it's it's a worldview. It's hashkafa. Hashkafa in Hebrew is worldview in English. Or we can even say, uh, we can even talk in English about, um, not an apocalypse, yes, an apocalypse, uh, but I'm looking for another word. There's another theological word that we can use. Um, let me think about that theological word for a second. Oh. Such an easy word, and I've forgotten it. Not apocalypse. Yes, it is apocalyptical, but there's another word. There's... there's there's another word. Uh, it's an important theological word, but we say in Spanish, uh, el santo se me, el santo se me fue al cielo, which means the saint has left me and gone to heaven. Uh, it's a Spanish way. It's, it's a religious Spanish way of saying I've forgotten. El santo se me fue al cielo. The saint has gone to heaven. I've forgotten. <laughs> Ay, caramba. So anyways, uh, that's what the New Testament is. It's all these things. So Revelation, not as a book, but as a concept, as a concept and a worldview, Kashkafa, begins in Matthew 24. So the book of Matthew in, 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 uh, in Hebrew is Matai. Matai 24. Oh, that's not 24, that's a 5. Can't fool me. There it is. Matthew 24, the revelation begins and continues all the way through the book of Revelation. So if you want to understand the book of Revelation, start in Matthew 24. Okay? So there it is, guys. Uh, when we're talking about the Bible, we are talking about Genesis in the Christian Bible to Malachi. That is the official legal Bible. This is the definition of, of the Bible in Hebrew. In the Christian world, it is Genesis to Revelation. And the Christian Bible does not have the authority of the Jewish court and Jewish law. What does that mean? It means that the New Testament is not binding because it is not a, a Tanakh, it's not a law, it's not a Torah uh, on its own. It is not binding. What does that mean, it's not binding? It means you cannot derive religion from the New Testament, okay? You cannot derive a religion From the New Testament. I know I, I know I've said this, but I'm writing it so it sticks in your head and mine. You cannot derive a teaching, sorry, a religion from the New Testament. If you read the New Testament and you derive a new religion, you are in paganism. It's no longer Judaism. So the New Testament, you have to read it with the eyes of the Torah. If something in the New Testament is not in the Tanakh, it's wrong. It was added. It's an addition of the Greco-Romans because they appropriated these writings. This is how I study the New Testament. 
I study the Torah uh, first and, and the wisdom sayings, everything in the Torah. Once I know the Torah, then I can tell you what is biblically correct in the New Testament and what is an addition, what has been changed in order to accommodate uh, Christian propositions and doctrines. Now, this is not a series against Christianity. This is about the Bible. And unfortunately, there are going to be some truth that comes out as I teach. If you're a Christian, do not get offended. Stick with these teachings and lessons. You're going to learn something vital. And you're going to understand at the end your salvation, which you hold and claim in Jesus or Yeshua. Your salvation will be made clearer by your understanding of the Bible. So don't get mad at me just yet. Put on your seatbelt. We are going on a fantastic wild ride. At the end of it, you're going to be grateful that you stuck around. Please share this video with your friends. Please click uh, like and also please click uh, the share button and the subscribe buttons and help me to grow this school so that everybody can have at last a perfect understanding of what the Bible is. So here we are. The legal Bible ends in Malachi. The New Testament is Jewish treaties. It is Jewish history, biographies, prophecy, revelation, and rabbinic letters, right? Hope you love this, and uh, I can't wait to make the next video. Have a wonderful afternoon, if uh, wonderful evening if you're in Africa, if you're in the Americas, have a great afternoon. See you later.